As we come to God's holy word this morning, we are in Psalm 95, which is on page 590 of your pew Bible. It will also be on the screen. 590, Psalm 95. This morning we will be finishing our sermon series through the Psalms with a theme of Christ is King. Before we read from God's Word, let's ask Him to bless it this morning. Father, we thank You that we can come before You and that we can open the pages of Your Word. We thank You that it is in our own language and that we can understand it. We thank You that we can gather around it this day and hear it. We pray that it would bring fruit, that it would be buried deep in our hearts, and that You would nourish it. And Father, I pray that Your Spirit would rest upon me, a sinner, as I seek to proclaim Your Gospel to Your people. May the meditations of my heart and the words of my lips be acceptable in Your sight, O Lord, my Rock and my Redeemer. Amen. Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the Rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In His hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are His also. The sea is His, for He made it, and His hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, they are people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You know, friends, there are many fables and stories that have been around our world for many generations that I find enjoyable. One such story or fable is that of the tortoise and the hare. Right? There is much to learn there, but one of the things that we should learn from that parable or that story is that we should focus on what we're doing. Right? Another great story I love is the story of Robin Hood. Right? The moral there is that taxes are unjust. One of the stories that I have a deep love for are the ones that deal with the Arthurian legend. Right? Just saying the name Excalibur probably shakes a little bit of dust off your head, and you remember the story of the great King Arthur and the magical sword that he pulled from the stone. Now you remember the story, right? This magical sword is stuck in the stone, and only the person who can pull it will be king. Now, the person who pulls the sword from the stone is not the mighty man. He's not the scholar of war. No, it's the teenage Arthur who pulls the stone and unites the peoples of Britain. Now, I love this story for many reasons. It's it's a story of knights. It's a story of the round table. It's a story of doing good and living well. And... If you talk to some of the youth, you might be able to find a video of me playing Arthur in the big budget remake while I was in high school. I swear it's amazing. But the details of the story of King Arthur change based on who tells it. But ultimately, Arthur is betrayed, he's killed, and he's set adrift in a boat to be healed at the magical island of Avalon. And there he will slumber until Britain has need of him And he will rise again and bring the people victory. And we've talked about this story theme before, friends. It shouldn't take much brain space for us to understand where this story truly comes from. For it's not a slumbering once and future king of Britain that we wait for. We wait for the return of the living king, Jesus Christ. The one who was lifted high. The one who did indeed die, but was raised to life three days later. And now sits at the right hand of God the Father. He will come again. As we finish our sermon series through the Psalms, as we're focusing on how Christ is the King, it is fitting that we end with Psalm 95, which reminds us that serving King Jesus faithfully is a difficult daily choice. 
The theme of Psalm 95 is that Christ is the king over creation and the rock of our salvation. When we say that Christ is the rock of our salvation, we're not talking about small little rocks that you decorate your landscape with. We're talking about a boulder that cannot be moved by human hands. We're talking about a rock of substance. And as Psalm 95 is going to show us, this day and every Lord's day, we enter into the worship of our God, the rock of our salvation, with joy. And we'll see this theme in Psalm 95 in four ways. Worship the King, honor the King, trust the King, and follow the King. Worship, honor, trust, follow. These four elements in Psalm 95 will tell us who our God is, what our God has done, and what our God will do. See, when it comes to the Psalms, right, we're constantly having to read them alongside the New Testament. Because as we talked about many times, the name Christ does not show up in Psalm 95. However, we know that He is there. Right? We know that Christ has been exalted in His resurrection. And that all that is ascribed to Yahweh is also ascribed to Christ and the Holy Spirit. And Psalm 95 begins in the same way that we begin our worship, with a call to worship. Look at verse 1. O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. All right, it's important for us to understand, friends, that the call to worship, much like the benediction, are not just mere words. We are called into worship through the words of our God. He is the one that calls us to worship Him. There's a reason we don't do our announcements, no matter how fun they might be, during the service. We do them before the call to worship. From call to worship to benediction, we are in communal worship with our God and with heaven. When we're singing, we're praying, partaking of the Lord's Supper, hearing the word preached, we are worshiping corporately together with heaven. Now, we don't understand how this happens, right? It's a divine mystery. However, just because we don't know how something happens doesn't mean that thing is not happening. Note then that the psalmist calls us to worship with joy, invoking the covenant name of God, Yahweh. And what are we to make joyful noise to? A rock? You've got to know something about rocks, friends. Rocks are very important. Why are rocks important? You see, they didn't have the technology back then to break rocks like we have today, right? When we're talking about rocks, we're talking about these giant rocks that would be hard to move, right? Rocks that could shelter you for safety. Rocks that you could build upon like cliffs, giving a structure sturdy foundation. And as well, large boulders were used as boundary markers, right? If you want to know where your property starts and your neighbor's property ends, you put a massive boulder there that nobody can move. Then there is no doubt. And as well, the Old Testament is full of examples of people taking rocks and using them to mark places of great significance. Right? You'll remember back to our Joshua series where large rocks were pulled out of the Jordan River and set on the shore and the banks so that people would remember what happened there. God is the rock of our salvation. Right? He, he puts a tangibleness to this salvation. Right? Like a drowning victim who is now put on dry ground. God's salvation should be evident in our lives. Which is why the psalmist continues in verse 2. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. Now we already know a little bit about Hebrew poetry from this series, right? This is classic where one line explains the previous line. But what we should see here is that the people viewed the presence of God as tangible. They viewed the presence of God as something they could see, something they might be able to touch. Why? Because they saw God's actions over and over. Right? A pillar of cloud by day. A pillar of fire by night. The glory cloud filling the temple. The terrible plagues. The bread that fell from the sky. They could see God's action. But yet you might say... But yeah, it's easy to believe in God when these things are happening in front of your face. Friends, over 5,000 people saw the bread and the fish multiplied by our Lord, and yet they still marched and yelled, crucify. Seeing a flashy miracle does not guarantee faith. Now I contend that while I may not have seen a pillar of fire leading me by night, I have seen on a regular basis how the Lord has saved me from dreadful situations. 
I have seen the Lord's faithfulness leading me, not by cloudy pillar, but by His Word. And I bet if you thought about it, you could look back and see where God has been leading you. Right? Life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Where is He leading you? First and foremost, our God leads us to worship Him. And it is inside that worship that our God calls us to honor Him. Honor Him with our thoughts, our prayers, our worship, because of all that He's done. Listen to verses 3 and 4. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. In His hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are also His. As we talked about a few weeks ago, the creation of God is astounding. What He has formed with His hands in this world is amazing. The vast mountain peaks have been formed by God and it is only now that we can fully see them in their glory up close because we can fly. But one thing we cannot do is survey the depths of the earth. Verse 5, the sea is His for He made it and His hands formed the dry land. You may not know this, but 95% of our world's oceans have been unexplored. Our God has formed the earth in such a way that we cannot even fathom the depths of the soil we walk on. And if you look up, the picture only gets bigger. How far does space extend? How many thousands of planets are there? How many galaxies are there? We don't know, but God does. And all of these things were created through Jesus, as John 1 tells us. We honor God when we proclaim Him King over it all. We honor Him when we recognize that we can never know the depths of His creation, and yet He knows every inch of His creation and every molecule of our bodies. The Lord knows the heights of the mountains and the depths of the sea, but most importantly, our Lord knows the depth of our hearts. See, the greatest work of God is not the lofty mountains or the dangerous seas, But the greatest work of God are the souls of man. No other creature has this part of them. Animals will come and go. Plants will grow and die. The flesh on our bones will waste away. But our souls are eternal. We honor the King when we remember that He has chosen us. Friends, that choosing came at a steep cost. Understand this. Not just anyone gets to come in the presence of God. There are countless times in our Bible history where God tells His people to stay far away. Do not come near lest you perish. For I am too holy for you. If you look back to the temple days, the high priest, when he would go into the Holy of Holies, he would have a rope tied around his leg in the event that he died in there so that the people could pull his body out without going in there and dying themselves. Our God is a holy God. He cannot stand to be around sin. Sin cannot enter His presence, which is why at the appointed time, the Christ, who had been with God since the beginning, arrived to stand in the gap between us and God. We worship and honor the King because standing in the gap meant death and hell. Jesus knew this, which is why He went anyways for us. God's choosing of us came at a steep cost of the life of His Son. So why not worship Him? Why not come before Him? Why not worship and bow down? Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, as verse 6 says. How could we not have this posture of worship before Him? He's rescued us. God has obliterated sin's grasp over us that it would not claim us any longer. God put our sins onto Christ, charging it to His account instead of ours. That is how we can stand before Him as righteous and spotless in His sight. That is how when we pray to Him, we know He hears us. With Christ at the right hand of the Father, speaking on our behalf, interceding for us, we have nothing to fear. For He is our God. We are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. What a blessing it is to know that we don't have to do this life on our own. Friends, it should bring us comfort to know that the Good Shepherd is no hired hand. He does not flee at the first sign of trouble. He is our God. 
he does not take vacations. He does not take breaks. He calls to the sheep continually and leads them forward. But it's possible that you might be thinking, what about the end of this psalm? This is an odd psalm. Right? Usually the psalms kind of tie things up nicely at the end. This one doesn't. Friends, it is imperative that you understand why the call to worship in the first half is so robust. Why we must have such a high view of our God. Because when we transition to the second half, we see a very important truth. While we are guided by the shepherd through the wilderness of this life to our eternal home, we must learn from the negative examples of those who came before us. What follows is a call to trust God even in the most dire of circumstances. We must trust our shepherd, right? Unlike those who came before us. Look at verses 7 through 9. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. So this word Meribah, it comes from the Hebrew word meaning to strive or to contend. And the word Massa comes from the Hebrew word meaning to test, to prove, or to tempt. See, these are two different places, two different events, but they're both roughly the same. The people of Israel are out in the wilderness and they don't have any water to drink, so what do they do? Just what you would do if you were in the middle of nowhere in the hot sun with no water and nowhere to go. We would complain. We would grumble. What are we going to do? There's no water. Where should we go? We don't know where we're going. The people grumble against Moses, but more importantly, they grumble against God. They insinuate that they had all the water they could drink back in Egypt, all while forgetting that they were in slavery. So in Exodus 17, God tells Moses what to do. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. You shall strike the rock, and the water shall come out of it. The people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? They saw great sight after great sight, and they dared to wonder, Is the Lord among us? Not even, and even though the generation in the wilderness was ungrateful, the Lord still provided water for them. Moses goes out and strikes the rock as he's told to, and water pours forth. But this is not the only time where we see the potential for hardening of hearts. Right? The people constantly grumbled and complained. The people constantly questioned the motives of this God they were supposed to follow. But that would never be us, though. Right? We would never ever doubt the words of our Lord and King. We would never grumble against Him for what is happening to us. Oh, wait a minute. We do that all the time. We grumble and complain and cry out and ask God, why is this happening to me? Friends, we must not harden our hearts as the shepherd calls us through the wilderness. You see, the wilderness is fraught with danger. It's fraught with sickness. There's plenty of starvation and drought. But all the while, the Lord gives us His Word to guide us towards Him. He calls us to trust Him. He calls us to walk the path that He has set before us. And friends, just in case we were tempted to think that Israel's grumbling was a fluke, we see the event happening again. The stage is the same. The people have no water to drink. And you would think in their minds that they would remember, hey, We were at a rock like this once before, and the Lord gave us water. But no, they grumble against God and Moses. We pick up the story in Numbers 20. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff, assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them to drink, and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank and their livestock. 
The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you do not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. Not a fluke. And at this time, Moses is angry and decides to not follow the Lord's instructions either. See, the Lord told Moses to speak to the rock. First time, he told him to strike the rock, and he did, and water came out. This time, he says to speak to the rock. And what does Moses do? He goes out, takes his staff, strikes the rock, nothing happens. He strikes the rock again, and then all of a sudden, the water comes out. He failed to trust in God's promises. He failed to hear God's voice in that moment. They all failed to trust the Lord. And while the Lord did not loathe Moses, God nonetheless did punish Moses for his action. He punished Moses by not allowing him to enter the promised land. Now this isn't to mean that somehow Moses was thrown from God's presence. No. Moses walked with God. He was shown the promised land from afar. And then he walked with God into the wilderness and no one saw his burial. See, Moses trusted in his God, and yet he missed out on the one thing he'd been working towards because of his temper. However, rest assured that while God kept Moses from entering the promised land, he did not keep the soul of Moses from entering his rest. See, for it is the work of Christ on the cross that changed everything, past, present, and future. The work of Christ was available for Moses as well as for us. For even in those moments of Moses' life, he did not cease to be found in the presence of the Lord. Paul expounds on this in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. See, the striking of the rock was intentional. Christ was the rock. See, Christ, while not having been born in the flesh yet in this moment, was still present with His people. The rock that followed the people. See, Christ was the burning bush. Christ was the cloudy pillar. Christ was the fiery pillar. Christ was the rock that watered them. Christ is the visible manifestation of God. Before He comes in the flesh, He is pre-incarnate. If Christ was with the people in such ancient times, how much more then is Christ with us since His Holy Spirit dwells inside us? Friends, trust the voice of the King. Do not be tempted to grumble against God. Do not be tempted to hold God accountable for where you are because of what choices you make. Trusting the King means following the King no matter where He leads. The close of our psalm, friends, reminds us why it is important to follow faithfully. Look at verses 10 and 11. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known My ways. Therefore, I swore in My wrath they shall not enter my rest. There you have it. God speaks through the psalmist to remind us of the plight of the generation of Israel in the wilderness who spurned their Lord's leading. How many of that generation entered the promised land? Two. Caleb, Joshua, and their families. Now friends, as much as I love the narrative of King Josiah and I love that story, I think the narrative of Joshua and Caleb has become my favorite. Two men out of the entire congregation of Israel that came out of Egypt that saw every single thing that God did. Two made it to the threshold of the promised land and stepped foot inside it. These two brothers in the faith saw it better to follow God faithfully than their own desires. They were there when no water could be found. And rather than grumble and complain, they waited on the Lord. And as their brethren died and were overthrown in the wilderness, these two faithful battle buddies encouraged each other not to give in to despair. What a day it must have been for them when their eyes beheld the land flowing with milk and honey. 
What a day it must have been when they stood side by side and saw the object of their hope, knowing that all their striving was worth it. Friends, this life is short. But the call from our King is to serve faithfully, not to serve ourselves. Paul reminds us the merit in studying the plight of the Israelites and in, in the merit in studying Psalm 95 as he continues in 1 Corinthians 10. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Friends, I urge you today, do not harden your hearts when things start to get tough around you. Our forefathers were tempted to abandon the path that God had set before them and return to a life of slavery in Egypt. And as Pastor Mike has been preaching in the evenings through Hebrews, we're reminded the Hebrew people wanted to return to Judaism, forsaking the Gospel of Christ. Friends, there will always be a road backwards. There will always be a call to rest in the household of folly and partake of the stolen feast that she provides. She will always call with the wine of wrath that she pours. Do not eat there. Do not dwell there. Free from, flee from folly and follow your king. Friends, the king calls us to live faithfully. Think about how many people have lived on this earth since the beginning. Many will hear the call to worship their king, and many will come and worship the king. Still less will truly honor the king. Fewer still will truly trust the king. And of all the people who have ever lived, few will faithfully follow their king. This is a very sad reality. Friends, do not turn from the path. Do not forsake Christ's work on the cross. And if you hear the voice of the Lord today, do not harden your hearts. Put your secret sins to death. Flee from temptation. Friends, this is the promise from Scripture. If you endure the path and live faithfully before your God, you will enter the glorious rest of the promised kingdom to come. Friends, what good is it to gain everything you can in this world, but yet forfeit your eternal soul? We all need to hear this message. Whether we've been following faithfully for many, many years or for just a brief time, we need to learn from the negative examples of our forefathers. And even if you've been seemingly lost in the wilderness for some time, you are not so far gone that you cannot find the path back. But do not delay. Seek the Lord while He may be found. For if we endure through the power of Christ, there will come a day when we will see all the nations around us fall. And yet we can't help but smile as we stand and stare at the threshold of our inheritance, the bountiful light of God streaming forth. If we follow our shepherd king through the wilderness, through the fraught areas of danger, we will reach the mighty Jordan River. And it will be parted before us. And we will see Caleb and we will see Joshua and all those who persevered in the faith. And above all else, we will not only hear our Jesus, but we will see our Jesus face to face. If we endure, friends, we will hear words contrary to the end of Psalm 95. If we endure, we will hear our King Jesus say with boldness and excitement, you shall enter my rest. Welcome home. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the call on our lives to follow You. Lord, help us in our unbelief. Help us to not stray from the path. And as we walk and enter the valley of the shadow of death, we know our Lord and Savior has gone before us willingly. Help our hearts, Father. We doubt we grumble. We complain. And in our hearts we say, where are You, God? Why aren't You here? All the while looking back and seeing Your faithfulness day in and day out. Turn our hearts to You, Father. 
Help us to serve You faithfully. Bless us as we walk this path towards Your kingdom. For that is our goal. Lord, we are not living for this life. We are living for the next. For these bodies are frail. And yet You have put eternity in our hearts. Help us to understand what that means. And as our forefathers grumbled in the wilderness, Father, help us to learn from their example. For we no longer need to strike the rock, for You have struck Your Son for us. And after His humiliation was ended, and His exaltation was begun, He now sits at Your right hand, interceding for us, caring for us, praying for us, and exhorting us to follow Him by His Spirit. Bless us this day, Father. Keep us from sin. We pray all this in the name of Your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.